All right, Florence, would you like me to get started? That would be wonderful. Thank you very okay. much, Lori. Go ahead. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone to the 2020 uh, COVID Info Commons Research Webinar for January. This is our first webinar of the new year, and we really look forward to introducing you to our great roster of upcoming events in 2022. My name is Lauren Close. I'm the Operations and Communications Manager for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub here at Columbia University. I'm also a member of the COVID Information Commons project team. The COVID Information Commons, or the KIC as we call it, is a COVID-19 research collaboration platform brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs and funded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. Every month, we at the KIC bring together scholars from all across the country to share their research findings in the form of lightning talks. Each scholar will also engage the community directly, answering questions about their work during a Q&A session at the end of our presentations. But before I introduce you to today's fantastic group of speakers, I'd first like to invite the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub's Executive Director, Florence Hudson, to say just a few words and tell us a bit about the KIC. Thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you for doing a great job, as always, leading us through these KIC webinars. So uh, the COVID Information Commons was funded by a National Science Foundation Convergence Accelerator Rapid Award in 2020. Um, and they contacted us and asked us to create a location, a commons, a portal, where people could find, easily find all NSF funded COVID research. When they originally contacted us in March of 2020, and I did a quick NSF simple search, there were only 32 awards. And I thought, oh, I could do this on my laptop. Then there were 990 by the end of the year. Um, and now we have 1,722 in the COVID Information Commons portal. So um, the NSF has actually asked us to, um, to extend the, the kick and for four more years. So we received an additional award um, in October of this year and, of 2021. And so this will go through um, September of 2025. During this period, we're adding a lot more NSF COVID-related awards, um, which was funded by the American Rescue Plan um, kind of recovery act. And we're also going to be adding NIH awards um, and looking at CDC, AHRQ, and other vetted and funded awards. Uh, we're really delighted that this, uh, from just the beginning of Can You Create a Portal to today, we have over 1,500 people involved in the COVID information comments through our newsletter, they'll come to our meetings, um, utilize the portal, and uh, we're looking forward to that growing. So we're updating the website. You'll learn more about that next month. We're going to tell you a little bit more about the plan there. Um, we're hiring a COVID Information Commons program manager. We hope to announce that next month. And we're looking forward to the continued participation of all the great researchers, collaborators, professionals, and students. Um, we also plan on having another COVID Information Commons student challenge this year, and you'll learn more about that next month as well. So this keeps going and growing based on the great collaboration you all are creating. And we encourage you to continue you know, um, engaging us, letting us know how else we can help. And actually on today's uh, meeting, we have two of the researchers that presented way at the beginning when we started this whole thing. Um, and they're gonna be able to give us an update on how their research has evolved. And NSF actually asked us that last week. We, we have a monthly meeting with them to talk about the project and a weekly project team meeting. And they said, so how has the research evolved? How is it going into recovery now that we have the recovery plans? And what I said was, well, you know, recovery is, the definition of recovery from COVID is changing <laughs> um, since we're learning to live with it um, for quite a while, maybe forever. So um, we are gonna be looking at that as we move forward to and creating some discussions around um, the new areas of collaboration we should be considering together. So we wanna keep this as this dynamic, great, very intelligent, very focused, very dedicated group that you all are um, and continue to let us know how we can help you more. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thank you, Florence. And I want to take this opportunity to highlight one additional item for our audience about the KIC. Um, our, our team at the KIC has been working closely on a new accessibility initiative that we're very excited about. Uh, along with our group of fantastic students, we have some volunteers and with them have begun the process of transcribing and translating all of our 85 previous kick lightning talks and presentations. We've accumulated 85 individual speakers 
since we began the project in 2020. And so with the help of our team, we've already transcribed 44 of those talks into written English, and we'll then begin translating them into Spanish as well. We're hoping that in 2020 that we can expand this program further by maybe bringing this content as well to the deaf community with the help of American Sign Language. We're um, exploring different options, but we're really excited about this opportunity to bring this content about COVID research and scientific innovations to a variety of audiences who have different linguistic backgrounds or accessibility needs. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to celebrate these students and volunteers really hard work as we dive into today's discussions. Um, obviously, at the end of today's webinar, we will begin the process of transcribing and translating these talks as well. So it's an ongoing process that we're really quite enthusiastic about. Um, and to that end, I want to highlight that this afternoon, in addition to Florence and myself, we will be working with one of our students at Columbia, Benji Sango, who will be providing um, some support to us after the event. He will construct a written summary of today's proceedings that will go on the website. So um, please keep an eye out for his, uh, you know, eagle-eyed analysis. And I want to thank him for helping us out with this event. Um, and so without any further ado, let me then uh, begin by introducing today's speakers. So this afternoon, we'll be hearing from four fantastic researchers who will talk to us about a variety of different topics related to COVID. We have um, Sarah Bowman from the Houtman Woodward Medical Research Institute, Dominique Duncan, who is at the University of Southern California, Gerald Marschke at the University of Albany, and Alan Porter, who is um, at Georgia Institute of Technology. So let me um, kick off the webinar by introducing you to our first speaker, Sarah Bowman. Um, as Florence mentioned earlier, Sarah was one of um, uh, one of our speakers who actually has previously presented her research at a kick webinar, I believe in, in 2020. So today we're hoping to hear from, from her and also from Dominique Duncan about updates to their work and even possible future plans for research. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen and I will hand things over to Sarah. Great, thank you so much. You can hear me. And can you see my screen? Yes, we can hear you, we can see you, it looks great. Perfect, okay. Well, you know, I wanna first of all say thank you for this opportunity to come and talk to kind of the, the KIC uh, webinar on the KIC webinar. Again, I'm, I'm excited to have a chance to update everybody um, on the progress we've made since I think October, 2020 is when we first, when I first gave a talk. So. Um, my rapid award is for enhanced SARS-CoV-2 high throughput crystallization for structural studies. Um, and I am uh, the director of a national high throughput crystallization center located in Buffalo, New York. And so first thing you might wanna ask yourself is what is structural biology? Um, and structural biology is really the study of the structure of what the different proteins or the pieces and parts of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and other things look like. So everything I'm gonna tell you about today is about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what you can see, can you see my uh, pointer? Great. Um, you know, everyone is very familiar with the, the, the ball with the red dot spikes poking out of it. And that, that is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, obviously it's quite a bit smaller than this. Um, and the red spikes coming out are actually what's called the spike protein. And that's what the vaccines are designed to kind of interact with. There are a large number of other proteins that are encoded by the viral genome. And our goal in structural biology is to understand what those structures look like so that we can then design therapeutics and drugs for actually fighting against those things. So one of the major ways to do this is through a technique called macromolecular X-ray crystallography. And in crystallography, uh, what we do is we take our protein samples. We have to screen them through many different conditions to find the ones that will generate a crystal. Once we have a crystal, we can shoot X-rays at it, do a bunch of other stuff and solve structures. And those are what you're seeing here in these big cartoons on, on the screen. My lab actually focuses on this, uh, this point right here, which is the bottleneck in this whole process which is finding the conditions that will make a crystal. And so what we do is we have a high throughput pipeline. We're the only facility in the world that actually has this uh, ability to do a 1,536 different conditions in one experimental assay. And we provide robotics, imaging instruments, and expertise. We've been running for 21 years. 
We monitor for crystal growth over time. And so the first thing we do, what I'm showing you here is one well out of the 1536 monitored over one week. We take pictures of that. It's kind of like looking at pictures with your cell phone, except we have to zoom in quite a bit more closely to be able to, to actually see what's happening here. And then we also have additional imaging modalities that help us really quickly identify these crystals. And so we're not gonna go into these details, but we have a very unique setup essentially. These, these actual images are from the first sample that was sent to our lab in, actually it was sent in March of 2020 um, and uh, was, was supported by the NSF Rapid that, that we received and the first structure that came out of, of our user groups. And so I'll show you the structure momentarily. So at this point, um, two years in, we have now crystallized a lot of different coronavirus proteins for structural studies. I'm showing a snapshot of six different proteins from six different groups across the country. And you can see for each of them that there are three different imaging modalities. Some of these look like what you would consider to be crystalline, like these nice little crystals. And some are harder to see, but with our imaging modalities, we can very quickly see them. And that's just part of why it's a very efficient and rapid way to do this. So we have, like I said, crystallized a lot of coronavirus proteins and our users who send us samples from all over the country and at this point all over the world have generated a lot of structures. And so at the top here, I'm showing uh, four different representative structures from users who have sent us samples. Many of these contain uh, inhibitors. Uh, so this is a potential inhibitor for the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. It's a major therapeutic target. This is a portion of the spike protein with a potential nanobody that could help interact with it. Um, and so at this point for our outcomes, we have had 33 user structures deposited to the protein data bank. And of those 33, we've got 24 potential inhibitors and one nanobody. Eight of our users have um, published papers so far, um, and we are actively working on more samples. We actually literally while I was on the uh, signing in today, I was finding out that we've got four more samples coming uh, next week. So, um, so this is a continuing operation where, where we, are, we are providing these services. The other thing that we've been uh, using our rapid funding for is actually to help us to do a little bit better with our data. So when we do high throughput experiments of any kind, you produce a tremendous amount of data. And for us, that means about 14,000 images per sample that we receive. And so we actually have built a particular software graphical user interface, uh, which we call Marco Polo. It incorporates a machine recognition of crystallization outcomes. Um, and it was actually uh, built by a very talented post-baccalaureate student, Ethan uh, Holloman, who's now a uh, graduate student at UC Davis. And you can see that we've got our 1536 platform. We can zoom into certain areas. We can watch crystals grow over time. We've got a tremendous amount of metadata. Um, and so it, it enables, um, it, it also really helps enable collaboration because we can, we can share this information with, with our users. And so we're really excited about the software. Another thing that I'd love to kind of get across is uh, that structural work has been absolutely critical in the past two years for the development of both the vaccines and therapeutics or drug treatments against SARS-CoV-2. So I showed at the beginning a, uh, an illustration of some of the structures that have been solved. And at this point, um, many of the proteins that are encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 genome, we do have structures. We have many of these structures in different kinds of states with different things found. And in fact, my uh, collaborators at HWI, Dr. Lynch and Dr. Snell, and I wrote this paper a couple of months ago, uh, actually detailing what the contribution of structural biology has been to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, and as a highlight of that, I'd like to highlight some of the work done by uh, my HWI colleagues at the MKCAT beamline at APS, at the Advanced Photon Source outside of Chicago. Um, it's a beamline that actually works with some of the major pharmaceutical companies in, in the world, including Pfizer. And as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, the FDA has recently approved Paxlovid, um, and this is the structure of Paxlovid. It is an inhibitor for the SARS-CoV-2 main protease and the diffraction data that was collected to be able to solve the structure of what this actually looked like and help design this drug was collected at the MCCAT beamline that we, we, uh, we direct at HWI. So finally, um, you know, one of the unique things about COVID-19 has been that it's been, of course, really terrible, but also a really amazing time to be a scientist and to do outreach and to talk about science. And so 
you know, one of the first things that, you know, I was able to do with the work that we were doing was actually the kick lightning talk in October 2020. Um, I've since done podcasts, um, interviews, including um, being featured uh, the day after the Super Bowl on the front page of the Buffalo News. Um, we actually had a student who photoshopped that to put a crystal over the Lombardi Trophy. Um, we've been active in social media. Um, I've been happy to be able to participate with Kick in other talks as well, including at the NIH. We've had a lot of student engagement. Um, and then very most recently, we actually were visited by um, Raven, the science maven. Um, and uh, any of you who are familiar with, with her work, she's a science communicator. And uh, we, we did some crystallization experiments in the lab, um, which were then featured in the Washington Post. So we're really excited about the work that we have been doing uh, against SARS-CoV-2. We're so excited about the structural biology efforts kind of worldwide that have helped to kind of really address what the proteins in the SARS-CoV-2 pro uh, virus actually look like. Um, and with that, I will, you know, thank you for your attention. Thank our crystallization center users, which come from, they come from all over the world. Uh, we've had a lot of people from um, all over the country actually make use of our services for uh, screening. Um, and we're very grateful for our funding from NIGMS and from NSF. Um, and so thank you for your attention. I look forward to uh, getting any questions after everyone else has talked. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah, um, for sharing your research with us. It's so encouraging to see how your work has um, developed even since we first heard about your presentation a year ago. Um, and to our audience, I just want to remind you that we'll be hosting a group Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. But in the interim, if you want to submit your questions to Sarah, any of our um, presenters, please do that in the chat and we'll try to get to them as they um, come in and then Florence will moderate that session at the end. So moving on, I wanna now introduce our second speaker, Dominique Duncan at the University of Southern California. Dominique, um, please feel free to share your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Um, let me pull this up. Okay, so um, thank you, Florence and Lauren and everyone uh, behind the COVID Info Commons team. Um, I first gave a talk about a year and a half ago and um, at the end of this talk, I'll give some updates about what resulted from that and a new collaboration that was formed. But um, I wanted to talk about our COVID-19 data archive, covid Arc, for short. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Southern California at the Keck School of Medicine in the Laboratory of Neuroimaging. So, um, we, in our lab, we have a lot of experience building large scale multimodal data archives, mainly for brain data. But at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought that um, we might be able to use our experience and resources with all of those data archives and develop a COVID-19 data archive. So we received, um, we were awarded an NSF rapid award to develop this um, data archive called COVID Arc. So what we do is we aggregate different types of COVID-19 data as well as resources. And we have built a platform of networked and centralized archives that store, curate, visualize, and disseminate multimodal COVID-19 data. Um, and we have a lot of data sets from around the world. Many of them are publicly available. Some are private. And so we've worked with those data providers to come up with data use agreements uh, that are tailored to their needs. And we have the metadata available on the website. So if users would like to request access to that, we facilitate that process, but then the data providers uh, make that final decision. And um, a lot of the data are stored at our site at USC, but for some of the data sets, uh, they're stored at the site where the data were collected and we have the metadata available so people can see that. And a lot of our work has been around harmonizing the metadata. And this is to facilitate research on pooled cohorts to make it easier for people to do different types of analyses across different sites rather than focusing on one site. Um, in a couple of slides, I'll talk about some of those challenges. Uh, and why we work on harmonizing it. 
And we've also integrated visualization and quality control tools and analytic tools, uh, again, to help researchers, uh, just to expedite research on COVID-19. And um, in addition to all the work around the data archiving and harmonizing, we are also doing different types of analyses on the data that we have, and we're using feedback principles and data science to study various aspects of COVID-19. So in terms of the data, we have different types of data. A lot of it focuses on chest CT images as well as x-ray, but we have clinical data that includes symptoms, vitals, comorbidities, demographics, patient history, geolocation. We also have for imaging, we have ultrasound and MRI, as well as some EEG data. And then uh, we've also provided lung masks, infection masks, and radiologist annotations. And here you can see we use IBM's HIPAA compliant encrypted high-speed file transfer system called Aspera. And this is a really easy way for data providers to transfer data um, to COVID Arc, as well as for users to uh, download data from COVID Arc to their computers. And right now we have 28 data sets from around the world. Um, as you can imagine, there is some inconsistent file naming across these different data sets, um, inconsistent metadata formatting, differences in storing infrastructures, as well as other differences um, across those data sets. So what we've done is we have put all of these together into one centralized data archive, and we've made sure that there's consistent file naming and organization, consistent metadata formatting, and ease in downloading several data sets from one location using Aspera. And here's just a screenshot of part of um, the data that we have. Um, I couldn't fit everything in on one slide, but you can just see um, if you go to covidarc.loni.usc.edu, you can find what data we have. And this is organized. You can see um, we have the site number, the location where the data were collected, the modalities, the file formats, any metadata that we have in addition to that, and then how many images there are. And some of them are split between COVID and not COVID. Um, and then we also have information on whether or not it's publicly available. So now I just wanted to highlight a few of the projects that my students have been working on. Um, they have been very productive and have been doing really exciting research. I have a few NSF research experiences for undergrads and um, Aksh Garg is one of those. He started while he was in high school and now he's an undergrad, um, a first year undergrad at Stanford. And um, just last week, his paper was accepted in expert systems with applications. And here he did a comparison of 40 convolutional neural network architectures um, to distinguish COVID versus not COVID. And he found that the best model efficient net B5 yielded um, extremely uh, high accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. And um, the model uh, also relied on clinically relevant features such as ground glass opacities and consolidations, which are often seen in um, COVID-19 patients. Um, another project, Alex Bruckhaus is another REU awardee. Um, so this work was published in the Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health. And um, here he and other students were looking at the vaccination dynamics in California. So they looked at something uh, called the Social Vulnerability Index and the SVI has, um, they looked at four SVI themes, including socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, housing type and transportation, and minority status and language. And they found that the lowest vaccination coverage was in high vulnerability groups. 
Um, minority status and language yielded the largest disparity in coverage between low and high vulnerability counties. So I think that this is really important work, especially as we're trying to um, get more of the population vaccinated. Another, um, another paper that uh, Alex Barkhouse and other students published um, was looking at um, post-lockdown infection rates following reopenings. So they looked at 83 counties across the United States with high COVID-19 case counts last year. And they were looking at different types of businesses and they separated uh, between a full reopening or a partial reopening. And they were looking at the infection rate changes before and after those reopenings and seeing um, which businesses had the biggest effect in um, rise, a rise in infection rates. And so um, bars and gyms played an important, um, a large role in that. Um, Yuja Zhang, who is my project assistant on this project, she did a review paper last year looking at the blood type association with COVID-19. So she looked at 23 studies that um, had an overview of blood type as both a risk and protective factor, um, how, how certain blood types, people with certain blood types are susceptible for testing positive and the clinical outcomes of severity. And she also went through the genetic associations and potential underlying molecular mechanisms there. And then Azrin Khan, who has been an REU fellow the past two summers, she is working on this project looking at threshold-based lung segmentation. So this is a multi-step thresholding method to quantify lung abnormalities um, with better performance than existing methods. And since I'm running out of time, I'm going to rush through this a little bit, but I wanted to talk about a collaboration that started um, because of that first COVID Info Commons um, talk that I gave and Michael Pisani and Albert Shaw from UCSD from San Diego, they also gave talks and um, we started a collaboration after that. We also submitted a smart health proposal. Um, which didn't get funded, but we resubmitted this past November, so we're waiting about that. But this is just a screenshot of one of the um, outreach webinars that we had for high school students in Southern California. And um, collectively, our students gave lightning talks about their project, and that was, um, that was very successful. And I just wanted to thank you. This is the lab website, the COVID ARC website. Please email me if you have any questions. And thank you to both NSF and NIH for the funding. Thank you so much, Dominique. Um, again, it's really exciting to see how people's uh, research on COVID has evolved since we started exploring this topic this time uh, almost two years ago. Um, I'd like to now welcome Gerald Marschke at the University of Albany. Um, Gerald, please feel free to begin your talk. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Jerry Marshke. Uh, I'm a, a labor economist at SUNY Albany, economist at SUNY Albany that specializes in labor. And um, uh, what I want to do is talk about some results from a, a, the first paper that uh, uh, RAPID has generated. So we received an NSF RAPID about a year ago to study the impact of COVID on STEM workers and also uh, consider policies that might attenuate the effects of the COVID-19 recession on STEM workers. So what we've done so far is describe the effect of COVID-19 on STEM workers. So let me start though um, uh, with some administrative work. I wanna read quickly a disclaimer and, and acknowledge that um, any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this material are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation and the National Bureau of Economic Research. The findings and conclusions in this paper are those of the authors and should not be construed to represent any official USDA or US government determination or policy. 
All results have been reviewed to ensure that no confidential information is disclosed. And uh, as this is funded by the NSF, uh, we'd like to thank the NSF uh, for funding this project and also for Kick uh, for inviting us to present this material. So this is uh, based on a paper that we just um, uh, published as an MBR working paper. Uh, it's downloadable if you're interested in the full details. I'm just going to present a subset of the work that we did there. And this is done with Jim Davis, who's now at the USDA, Holden Deathorn, and Andrew Wong, who are economists uh, at, the, at the Bureau, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, okay, so uh, we're focusing on the STEM workforce. Why is the STEM workforce interesting? Interesting during a recession or a pandemic like this? Well, the STEM workforce is a key segment of the workforce. Uh, in that it, it affects uh, research and development and therefore it affects economic growth. And it is a you know, policy focus of much uh, education and uh, job policy in the United States. So uh, what we're interested in here in this paper is uh, understanding the effect of the Great Recession, the COVID recession on the STEM workforce and comparing its effect to the non-STEM workforce. Uh, and um, and then what we find, to give you a preview of what we find, we find that the STEM workforce has done relatively well uh, during the COVID recession. This recession has been terrible for employment generally. Uh, the uh, disemployment effect of the COVID recession is about twice as what it was uh, during the Great Recession 10 years ago. Um, uh, although the recovery has been much quicker, but the recovery is still not complete, as you're aware. So the uh, preview, to give you a partial preview of the results, it turns out STEM workers have done fairly well in comparison. They've been hit by the recession, but not in the same way that non-STEM workers have been hit. And then another focus of this paper is to, to understand well, what accounts for the relative resiliency of STEM workers. And you might think, well, it's their education, or it might be that they're in occupations where you, know, you can do your, your work remotely. It's not those things. It turns out that uh, neither um, education levels or ability to work remotely or a concentration in essential industries uh, explains this resilience. Okay, um, so there's been a fair amount of work. Actually, this work started coming out almost at the beginning of the recession uh, in, uh, in, in, I think, May and June, we saw the first papers uh, by economists who were looking at the disemployment effects of COVID and where it's concentrated. And the general consensus has been that the job losses have been concentrated amongst workers who are uh, less educated, skilled, and wealthy. And, and th those workers tend to be in occupations with more face-to-face -face contact and less ability to work remotely. And then there's another older and larger literature on the effects of education on employment outcomes during recessions. Uh, and that, um, that, that work has generally found, not surprisingly, that better educated workers suffer less employment loss and earnings loss during recessions. And then there's been some work this looked at uh, the effects of particular kinds of education on uh, recession resiliency. Uh, and this work has shown that workers, at least college graduates who uh, graduated with degrees in higher skilled disciplines had better labor market outcomes during uh, and just after economic downturns compared to uh, college graduates who graduated with degrees in, in quote, softer uh, disciplines. But there's not been any work, there are very little work done on STEM workers. Okay, so these plots, I'm gonna show you two sets of plots, one regarding the Great Recession and the other one regarding COVID. So this is uh, employment. These are the effects of the Great Recession on employment. And what we're plotting here on the left-hand side uh, is a ratio of uh, COVID employment. Employment uh, and each quarter since the beginning of the pandemic relative to what it was uh, during its peak prior to the recession in this case. and then in the COVID graphs prior to the COVID pandemic. And you can see that, um, uh, let me tell you what you see. You see that overall we get about a 7% decline in employment compared to the peak prior to the Great Recession, a 4% drop for STEM workers and about 7% uh, for non-STEM workers. And I'll talk about the output uh, graphs in a second. And then this is the, these are the results for COVID. You see that, um, uh, STEM employment fell about 5% relative to its peak prior to COVID. The employment you can see is bottoming out in, um, if you look at the horizontal axis that corresponds to quarter since uh, the pre-recession peak and the pre-recession peak is about the fourth quarter of 2019. So 
uh, employment is bottom, bottoming out, uh, disemployment is at its apex in about uh, in the in the second quarter of, of 2020, on the first first quarter of the pandemic, and then for uh, non-STEM employment, uh, um, the employment rate employment um, to uh, peak employment ratio is about uh, 86 percent. So they their employment falls by about 14 percent. And then afterwards, you can see uh, a rapid uh, increase in employment. For non-STEM workers, uh, we're still uh, we're still in a in a deficit situation. The employment is less than it was before uh, COVID began. For STEM workers, uh, we are back to quote normal. And then on the right hand side, in both uh, slides, I have the output. And what I'm interested in here is understanding the extent to which firms are hoarding workers and whether that is different for STEM workers versus non-STEM workers. Hoarding workers is where the employers hold on to workers uh, for when the economy bounces back. So for example, if they have training investments that they want to protect. And there's no evidence of hoarding um, during the Great Recession, but for the COVID recession, there is evidence of hoarding of STEM workers, not non-STEM workers. Their uh, employment falls by more than actually output falls in a non-STEM worker intensive industry. But in STEM worker intensive industries, uh, STEM employment employment is falling by less than uh, what output is falling by. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to look at a set of uh, workers who I capture just before the pandemic begins. This is a representative set of workers. Some of them will be STEM workers and some of them will be non-STEM workers. And the STEM workers in my sample, this is the current population survey sample from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's monthly data on a set of workers who I first capture just before COVID hits. Uh, what I'm interested in doing is seeing to what extent, you know, it's demographics, to what extent it's uh, the industries that workers are in and to what extent it's occupational characteristics and so on that explains the fact that STEM workers enjoy a 9% employment advantage compared to non-STEM workers. That is their employment falls by 9% less than non-STEM workers. So I'm gonna look at things like demographic characteristics and educational characteristics and some job characteristics, which I wanna describe quickly now. So this slide shows you the differences between STEM and non-STEM workers in terms of educational attainment, demographics, uh, firm size, the size of the employer uh, that, that uh, employs the worker, and the educational requirements of the job as opposed to educational attainment. So one thing I, I'll point out is that uh, STEM workers are half as likely as non-STEM workers to be female, Black, or Hispanic. And uh, they're much more likely, about three times more likely than non-STEM workers to be Asian. Um, their educational levels are very different. Uh, college, uh, the STEM, STEM workers, about 70% of STEM workers have a college degree or better than a college degree. And about only 30% of non-STEM workers have a college degree or better than a college degree. And they also tend to be in different industries. So here's the distribution of STEM and non-STEM workers across, uh, um, across industries. Um, and you can see that STEM workers, that's the, the red, the, the red um, those are the red um, rectangles. Uh, you can see they're concentrated in professional scientific and technical services. And uh, they're also seen in manufacturing. And non-STEM workers, uh, you see a lot of them in, in uh, retail and a lot of them in, in uh, accommodation and food service, industries that were hit very hard uh, by the pandemic. So that's gonna be part of the story. Now it turns out, so as I said, there's a literature which shows that, you know, the re remote work capacity of the occupation is important in, in explaining variation in the disemployment of COVID. And if you look at workers who are in STEM versus workers who are non-STEM, you see a big difference between uh, remote work capacity of STEM workers and non-STEM workers. So non-STEM workers are more likely to be in jobs that require physical activities and close personal proximity to coworkers and customers and so forth. Uh, and as a consequence, their remote ability is much less than the remote ability, if I could use that word, uh, for STEM workers. And they tend to be, interestingly, the STEM workers tend to be in industries that have not been deemed politically as essential. Uh, so that works against STEM workers and in favor of non-STEM workers, but remote ability works in favor of uh, STEM workers. And then if you look at the types of tasks that workers are engaged in, so there's a, a large literature in uh, economics that shows that 
uh, workers in, ta in jobs where the tasks are routine and non-cognitive tend to do worse in recessions and recoveries. And uh, it turns out that STEM workers are not in those kinds of jobs. They're in, typically in jobs that require tasks that are cognitive and non-routine. And then the last thing I want to show you before I show you the decomposition is that, uh, as you might imagine, if you're a STEM worker, STEM knowledge use is important in your employment, in your every, uh, everyday work. Uh, and here's the, the distribution of the importantness of uh, different kinds of STEM knowledge in, uh, in executing tasks on the job for STEM workers and non-STEM workers. And you can see that although there's some overlap, and that's interesting, a lot of non-STEM workers actually are using STEM knowledge of one kind or another on the job. STEM workers tend to be using more STEM knowledge on the job than non-STEM workers. Okay. Now, what we're interested in here, finally, is the, a decomposition of this difference, the nine percentage point employment advantage of STEM workers compared to non-STEM workers during COVID. We're interested in seeing if we can explain that in terms of the characteristics of the worker and the characteristics of the job. And so, in the interest of time, I won't go through this figure. I'm just going to summarize it in the next uh, slide. So I'm looking at uh, bullet points two and three. If I divide up the sample between college educated and non-college educated workers, I get different results. So for college educated STEM workers, and that's the bulk of the STEM workers or the STEM workforce, it turns out, and maybe this isn't surprising, but STEM knowledge use on the job explains about half of the advantage. So if you are in a job that requires ex extensive use of STEM knowledge, you are in a sense protected. And what's interesting about that result is that's also true for non-STEM workers. So a lot of non-STEM workers, about 70 million non-STEM workers are in fact in jobs that require some STEM knowledge use. Uh, those workers are protected too from the, um, uh, from the recession in terms of their employment. And then for uh, non-college educated workers, it's a whole host of things that matter. Non-routine cognitive tasks, composition of jobs matters for whether they're hit by the uh, COVID COVID uh, recession hard or not. Demographics are important and, and which industry you're in is also important. And then the last thing I wanna say is that we're looking at STEM workers. Some STEM workers do R&D, many don't. All R&D workers, almost all R&D workers are STEM workers. Those are important workers because they say they have a disproportionate effect on economic growth rates and productivity increases in industry. And it turns out that R&D expenditures and R&D employment and patenting didn't take much of a hit during, uh, during COVID. In fact, uh, although they fell, those three variables fell in the first two quarters of the pandemic, they didn't fall as much as uh, even this uh, STEM employment did. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald, that was great. Um, and as a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions about any of our presenters' uh, topics, which I'm sure you do, um, please either hang on to them for our moderated session at the end or feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I wanna now take the opportunity to introduce our final speaker for today, who is Alan Porter, um, who's based at Search Technology Inc. and Georgia Institute of Technology. Alan, um, please feel free to begin your presentation when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Let's see if I can get it going. We're sure you can. Okay. We have proof. Okay, got it? Not yet. Oh. No? Not yet. Oh, I don't know what's happening. So you're hitting your share screen button. There we go. That would help. Uh. <laughs> we gone? Looks great. Thank you. Yay. OK, success. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I wanted to share some results from a NSF rapid project that we did with the title here. And it's basically mining the, the biomedical uh, literature in ways to try to get access, 
conveniently and some different perspectives. Here's my background, I'll not go through that. Uh, basically, we're technology watchers trying to gather data and extract some usable knowledge from it. Uh, the particular project here was exploring causes and cures for COVID through improved access to the research. And I wanna to just touch on three elements. One is what we're calling intelligent bibliometrics to try to, to extract information from these abstract texts. Second is a peek at a recommender system to do some literature-based discovery beyond the data set we're actually analyzing. And third is a dashboard to share result. Uh, our, our shorthand for this is tech mining. The data at hand here are using the, the main National Library of Medicine kind of core uh, COVID search strategy. Uh, we use this straight through for a year and a half. And I'll be talking about two different subsets. One is about 60,000 records through early October 2020, on which we did a lot of the uh, intelligent bibliometrics type work. And the other is the most recent version of the dashboard, January 1st, to show you what it looks like right now. Okay, element number one, the tech mining is text analyses of science, technology, and innovation data resources, usually in the form of abstract records of research publication or patent, most typically. Uh, some of the things we've done here, one is look within the body of that research for what topics show accelerating attention and try to do that in a timely fashion. Won't be talking about that today. Second is tracking uh, topics over time. And here's a peek at that. Led by our colleague Yi Zhang in University of Technology, Sydney, uh, one uh, draws out by clustering the, the term usage for what are some topical clusters of interest over time. The process in its essence Take one time period, group the topics together based on uh, co-occurrence of terms, and then do this in successive periods, and then look at links amongst those topics. And I've got a couple of references here. I won't belabor, but they're tagged on at the back of the presentation. Here's a, a zoom in on a little piece of it. Um, our latest analyses back in 2020 showed rapid spread was a topic of interest. And that had forebears in very recent treatment of infectious diseases, a little earlier to studies noting on, and then going back into some of the previous coronaviruses, some work with PCR back in 2006 concentration, tracing back to SARS back in 2003. So one can do some links over topics and over time. Our second element, the literature-based discovery. And here we've used it just for a very simple recommender system. See if there's a topic you are interested in within the COVID literature, might there be some uh, useful research to you outside that literature? And the process here, uh, we generate a data set just as a simple illustration out of about 30 or more topics, comorbidities was one that we just picked here. And then within the, the COVID literature, in this case, that's 60,000 records, looking for the documents most related to that. Then do some text analyses there to, to clean the literature that the texts up and looking for what terms have especially high frequency in those documents and conversely, especially low frequency, calling that a knowledge model and then going out and looking at calculations of term frequency, inverse document frequency for those terms 
in the, the full PubMed Medline data set, those aren't identical flows. And to identify ab abstract of articles that might be of interest to somebody pursuing a particular topic like comorbidity. Um, here's a little illustration, three of the topics from comorbidities where we've added in a citation count as a second criteria. So if you're high on being cited and you're using the term similar to the comorbidity usage within COVID literature, might be of interest to you. Maybe take a look at these and it could be three articles or we could go all the way down to with loadings on the 33 million. Which I don't think anybody would want. And the last element uh, I wanted to go through was taking a look at uh, our dashboard buildup. And here is the project dashboard. And within that, I'm just mentioning a, a, a vaccine bullseye that our colleagues at Bizint put together, which is interesting to track over time. And I'm gonna take a look at our PubMed dashboard. And that's now the spotlighting the 150,000 150, abstract records as of uh, January 1st. And there is a demo there, a couple minutes to explain how to use it. Here's some of the different fields of data available. And let me just do a, a quick pop in. Uh, here's one version where we can go in and we could spot something of interest. And I'm just going to try to spotlight. And I think we're getting some sluggish response here. Uh, research in Iran. Uh, and we might go through that and, and see what some folks over there are doing with respect to comorbidities. And we might even spot an article somewhere in here that draws our interest. And here we can pop up that abstract record. So to do things quickly there, just one other illustration, if we wanted to spotlight most recent work, and that's from December of last 2021, this is incomplete because coding, uh, categorizing still is going on, cataloging, so on. But we could go in here again and, and pick what might be of interest. Uh, let me spot, hit Columbia. And there's some of the uh, 46 articles from associated with a, an author from Columbia in the last month. So that's our demo. If anybody wants to go to the dashboard, we'd, we'd love it. It's still a work in progress. And I'm basically done. There we go, resources and finish. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Alan. And I just dropped into the chat for everybody to look at the link that you were going to provide that allows people to um, review the site and the different resources you just highlighted. So thank you for that. And oh, yeah, and, and let me um, go ahead and uh, thank everybody for uh, presenting their research today. We appreciate all of your unique insights into COVID-19 and your contributions to the study of this subject. And for the audience, let me say that each of our speakers presentations will be made available on our website and on our YouTube channel later this week. And as we noted earlier today, those presentations will also be given additional accessibility features, including English and Spanish transcripts as we get to them. Um, and so before we segue into the Q&A session, which we'll close out with today, I want to also share with you as a group information about our upcoming COVID Info uh, Commons webinar, which will happen in February. Um, this is a great group of speakers, just like today. You can register to attend this event on our website, and we hope you'll join us then as well. Um, Finally, I'll mention to the audience um, this information about ways that you can get in touch with the KIC, um, take advantage of the ways that you can stay in touch with us, check out our website, 
We have um, a newsletter. Follow us on any one of these social media platforms. And if you have any questions or suggestions for our events, you can always email us. Um, I will drop the information from the slide directly into the chat. So check those options out at your own pace. Um, we really love hearing from you as our community. So please do reach out. And finally, I'll also mention that when we close out our Zoom webinar today, you will receive a pop-up notice asking you to participate in a Google survey about our event. Um, I know it's a bit of an ask, but we please um, request that you give us your feedback on the webinar format and content. We're always trying to improve, so we really appreciate your thoughts on this. Um, so I'm now going to open it up to Q&A from our audience. I think there were some questions and comments in the chat box, so thank you for that. Um, otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to Florence to begin this conversation. Sure. So I <clears throat> can you hear me okay? <laughs> so um, I'd like to ask a few questions to get the ball rolling, unless there's anybody who would like to speak up and ask the question. Obligatory five second rule. Okay, great. So, uh, Dominique, I think you were presenting the social vulnerability index, the SVI work. Was that you? Yeah. And I was um, one of the, the things you talked to, you showed a little bit about, I think, was um, vaccinations related to some of the things on the map that you showed. And in an earlier kick webinar last year, one of the researchers uh, brought up the idea that perhaps we should have um, a discussion on one of these webinars and we're looking at having some targeted presenters or topics in future webinars to bring us together on a topic. And one of them was about vaccine hesitancy versus vaccine availability versus perhaps the social vulnerability index. So do you have information underneath why there isn't as much vaccination as, as hesitancy or availability or they can't get out of work or, you know, do you have any insight like that yet? Yeah, I mean, we just looked at those four themes. So some of those are um, like housing type and transportation that would address um, if they can get to a vaccination site, maybe. Um, we didn't really look at hesitant, hesitant, hesitancy, sorry. We looked at socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status and language. So maybe um, language could potentially be an issue with trying to book an appointment. Very interesting. So what I'm thinking about is I planned on going back to that other researcher. I think um, the optimist in me was thinking, oh, we'll have this all figured out by the beginning of next year. <laughs> but that didn't really work. So um, perhaps um, since we're thinking that we're, um, since some people are thinking that we're going to be getting these boosters for quite a long time, kind of like uh, the flu shot, but you'll get to do it maybe twice a year um, if these variants keep on uh, becoming, staying as rapid as they are um, and the, the eff efficacy reducing so quickly. So um, perhaps that would be an interesting discussion to bring all the elements in, not just the hesitancy, but the social mm -hmm. vulnerability and everything with that. Do you think that might be an interesting topic? Yeah, um, I just posted a link to the paper in the chat. If Perfect. Look at that, but yeah, I agree. Okay, that's great. Um, so we're gonna when we get our new kick program manager, God willing, next month we're gonna start planning these new uh, this new programmatic material. So we'll be in touch on that, and you know how to get in touch with me anyway, which is great. Next, I actually had a question for Jerry. Um, I found that fascinating, your work, and uh, I'm a STEM person, and I, I think of healthcare as being very STEMI, but I, I, I don't know if I mis, um, misread one of, your, one of your bar charts, but it looked like the propensity of STEM workers or non-STEM was rather high in the healthcare line item, healthcare and uh, if I, I read that right, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, that's how we define STEM workers. Most healthcare workers are not STEM, according to the, you know, the typical US government definition of STEM workers. So we excluded people like nurses. Uh, those are considered um, near STEM. So we lump the near STEM. Although we separate the three groups in our paper, we have separate statistics uh, for this um, presentation. I group the near STEM with the non-STEM. It was very interesting. I found that to be non-intuitive. I don't know if that hit anybody else too, but um, 
That's very interesting. And it didn't have anything, I forget what the education side of that was. Did it also talk about if their education was STEM related? And no. Nerd so, okay. No, so uh, there has been work on STEM education uh, and what happens to STEM educated workers, you know, during your session, but nothing on, you know, a lot of not, you know, a lot of STEM educated workers go into non-STEM jobs. So we're, we were just looking at STEM. Yeah, very interesting. But that was very interesting information that you provided. Um, and then Sarah, I was wondering if you could um, tell people a little bit more. I know you were doing a lot of international collaboration. I know that some of that was actually enabled through the kick way back when. Um, when you said, well, two years ago when I started this, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's right. This was two years ago already, right? <laughs> All those years that we lost. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit about how the international collaboration started um, and to encourage others to like, you know, connect with their international collaborators because the COVID info commons is available open online around the planet all the time. So everybody can actually leverage it. Um, and we're all dealing with COVID, unfortunately. So could you maybe share a little bit about um, how that happened? Well, um, as I mentioned, I've been doing a lot of outreach and, and part of that outreach has been uh, the, the kick kind of programs. And in, in fact, I was contacted by a student in South Korea who had seen the kick webinar um, on YouTube and wanted to then kind of do an interview of, of kind of, okay, how is, how, how is data access actually being impacted by COVID? Um, and so it's part of her dissertation project. She is actually being advised by somebody in the UK. And, you know, so it was a very interesting kind of experience. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the, the structural biology community kind of in general is, is a very international community. Um, and I think that um, again, possibly because of kind of the, some of the work that some of the presentations we've been doing in, it, with Kick and, and other organizations, you know, the um, organizing the crystallography against Corona at the, you know, International Union of Crystallography, which is typically a very big meeting um, that happens um, on site every two years, but um, this was a hybrid meeting, so I got to go to <laughs> Prague, but <laughs> um, but it was the third most attended kind of session in that entire, you know, in that entire meeting, which has hundreds of sessions. So yeah, there's there's been all kinds of different ways that that things things have been kind of happening. And so, and you know, I personally am planning to uh, tweet out as soon as we get the links to the YouTube <laughs> YouTube videos to let people know. And you know, I I know that people are watching these things periodically. So I, I think that's great. I think it's great that you guys provide that that platform and and an ability for people to see see kind of what what such a such a breadth of work that people are doing on this, right? I mean yeah. it's just amazing. So it is amazing. And we're we're very honored and grateful we get a chance to do this. We always thank NSF and soon we'll be working more with NIH and we can thank them too, um, you know, for the collaboration we're going to be um, increasing. Um, but I, yeah, the more we can do the outreach and bring them together. And actually, Lauren um, will, will correct me if I'm incorrect, but I think we've had like 4,500 YouTube video views mm -hmm. since we started the kick. It's really incredible. We're seeing um, a number of people that are interested in not just the most recent events, but are going back into um, what I would consider our archive from when this all began and are really just exploring all the various topics that we've been covering in these webinars. It's, it's really great. So, uh, so yeah, spread the word and, you know, tell your friends, your family and you, people you don't like, you know, that could benefit from, uh, from seeing this. Um, then Alan, um, you know, it was very interesting watching your dashboard because in the COVID info commons, I don't know if you've had a chance to play with it yet, um, but you can go in and do something similar in finding um, certain projects and then bringing up the abstract. Right now with CNSF awards, we'll be adding NIH awards. It's part of our project plan from our kick extension that we got. Um, but the other thing that we're looking to do, and this is in uh, the proposal that was recently granted, is to create a new metadata and data search and discovery capability. And when I look at what you've done, it feels like um, it would be interesting to have that discussion and understand, like kind of crawl underneath what you've already done with PubMed and Vantage Point um, and some of the other work that you've done. 
um, and then see how we may be able to leverage it or it connects into this or something. Because what we currently have in the COVID Info Commons is the, the PI, um, the NSF, the award database includes information the PI submit. We're going to be putting out a new PI survey when we integrate NIH so we get you know, consistent information across the, the two sets. Um, but we also have a list of databases. So people will send us, you know, include my data set from Africa, mine from Australia. You know, it's like they're like, I want it in there. But what we don't do yet is when you put in a keyword in the kick, it goes against the corpus of the NSF awards right now. It doesn't crawl all those other data sets. And we do vet the data sets to make sure that they're a data set we would want you know, people to look at. But there may be an interesting opportunity to discuss what we're thinking, to show what we have, and then to look at what you have and think about what we can do to benefit this research collaboration around the planet over the next three and a half years. Oh. Yeah, we'd be excited to to explore further. Our rapid project was rapid. <laughs> it's, I, it's, I hear you. <laughs> um, but we've been updating the, the dashboard. Mark Markley, I see is in the, the, the workroom is doing all the work. Um, oh, okay. To, tuning the dashboard itself and the mechanisms of information coming in and, and so forth. There certainly are many other databases of interest. The one I mentioned the little link there to the vaccine bullseye that's yeah. drawing from clinicaltrials.gov um, and one can go elsewhere but sure give us a holler we'd love to okay i'll reach out to you and maybe we can bring in uh, mark as well that would be great because maybe what we create can help what you're trying to do too so it could be you know who knows yeah. that would be nice okay great Thank you for that. And uh, Megan, I think you have a question. You have your hand raised. Do you want to unmute and ask it live? Megan McCarter. Yes, thank you. Apologies, I'm joining from my lunch hour, so I'm on mobile. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, analysis, of, analysis of skills and uh, job resiliency. Uh, so this is very granular, but I was really struck that when you said STEM skills predicted job resiliency, regardless of whether they were a STEM professional or not. Um, and so I was wondering if you have insight as to whether that is that tells us the work of the STEM industry itself is being externalized to non-STEM workers, or if it's simply the fact that STEM skills are transferable to other industries and predict res resiliency in non-STEM industries, or if there's maybe something else I haven't thought of. Yeah, I can think of, that's a good question. Unfortunately, this is very descriptive uh, and we don't know why. I, I can think of three hypotheses why STEM knowledge use might be important. One is that there's something innate by people who use STEM knowledge. So maybe they're more energetic or creative and are more flexible. So they could be hiding that. Or it could be that the demand for such skills, you know, um, the relative demand for such skills for some reason have, has gone up during COVID or has not fallen by as much, hmm. you know, or it could be that if you are able to use STEM knowledge, then you have a set of skills that makes you uh, more able to kind of roll with the COVID-19 recession punches. But I can't tell you. Um, I can tell you that we're controlling for a lot of characteristics, personal characteristics like educational level, rate, race, and so forth. So that it might actually not be about something innate about people who do skill, you know, utilize skill knowledge. It could be something about the skills themselves. But well, I that's very interesting. Thanks for uh, musing on that. Yes, and thank you for asking that, Megan. I'm sorry if I called you Megan McCarthy. That's what I thought it said when I first looked at your little thing. I'm thinking, wow, Megan McCarthy is here. That's really cool. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but Megan, we're glad that you joined us. So I'm sorry if I called you the wrong thing. No worries. <laughs> It's like people used to call me Florence Henderson, but don't do that, please. Um, okay, <laughs> very good. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Um, oh, Jerry, did you want to ask a question or make a comment? I, I yeah, I do. Um, I find I mean, there's a, there's also a literature which I don't know very well, and I think Alan might know know it um, at least a little bit on the effect of COVID on uh, science. You know, what's the effect of COVID on science? And so there's a number of papers that show the effects seem to show the effects of COVID on publication rates and then like publication rates of women versus publication rates of men and, mm. and stuff like that. And then there's some recent work that um, 
uh, shows, seems to show that the degree of collaboration and new teams, new research teams, and kind of new synergies and new ideas, at least bibliometrically, uh, don't seem to be arriving at the same rate as they were before COVID. And I think the speculation was that it's, you know, it's the fact that we're not meeting in person anymore at conferences and workshops and seminars. And so I was str struck, you know, by Dominique's talk, you know, at the end, she says, oh, and there's this project, you know, that we got started as a result of meeting people on a kick, you know, a kick webinar, webinar, which I thought was interesting. And I just was wondering, because I don't do a lot of this, you know, even before COVID, I don't do a lot of collaborating um, outside of my sort of home network. I was curious, you know, what people thought about uh, COVID's effect on these kinds of new collaborations, maybe. You know, Dominique has a, a take on that. It seems to be working. COVID seems to be working for her, but maybe it's not working for her in the same way that, <laughs> way that uh, it's working. Yeah. For I mean, in some ways, it makes it a little bit easier um, for us to arrange meetings. Um, so, like with Mike and Albert, it was really easy for us to um, have regular Zooms to talk about our work um, for the outreach webinars that we were doing. We were able to get over 50 schools in the Southern California area to, um, to listen to the lightning talks by the students. That's something that couldn't have been done previously. Um, because of those webinars, a few high school students, not necessarily in the LA area have reached out to me and have gotten involved in the research. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily better, but um, in some ways it works well. You know, one thing we've seen um, is that it, it reduces the barrier to entry for people to participate. The information goes out there, it goes viral, they find out about it, they can easily click in, it's free, you know. Um, we have another program as an example called the National Student Data Corps, which we started about a year ago. And we created it as the Northeast Student Data Corps because we're the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. And like with most of our programs, we think 20 to 30 people might show up. We have almost 2,000 students and educators in this community now. And it is in countries all over the planet. <laughs> and uh, we actually have to ask them, Lauren and Emily, I was thinking, how did they find out about us? You know, um, you know, we have like, you know, Mali and Ecuador and Haiti and like all this stuff going on. We have a student in Ghana that wants to join an NSDC chapter. And I was like, could he be like the very Eastern end of the Eastern region, you know, like on the other side of the Atlantic, how are we gonna do this? So um, it appears that it, it reduces the barrier to entry and the information is easily shared right? So more people can participate. And we find that that's especially helpful for some of the underserved uh, communities where they don't have local access to this level of education or this level of content, and they can get it, you know? So I think it's very aspirational and inspirational in some ways. Um, and I think the combination of the fluidity of sharing information the reduced barrier to entry when you can just, you know, use your phone or go to a the library or school and like click in there or something. I think it actually helps the collaboration. The depth of collaboration, I think, is very interesting, though, too, as Dominique was talking about, you know, she and Mike Pisani were like, you know, going to present and they're both like, gosh, you're doing ground glass opacity. Really? Seriously? <laughs> it was just stuff like, you know, COVID, you gotta be kidding me. And you're just like right down the block, you know, and then their students got, you know, because one's at UCSD in San Diego, one is at USC in LA. Um, and so it's interesting that the depth that they got to very quickly as well, you know, because because we can create a common platform like this, where people are speaking about science and economics and epidemiology and crystallization, and we get it, like we hear each other, right? And you can find people like you um, when we can create these environments like this. Um, but then also, you know, students click in or other people and, and listen. Megan, Megan McCarthy will come the next time, Megan McCarter. But um, we can ask her. Can't hurt. She seems kind of to be like goes with the flow. Um, so I think, um, I think there are a combination of things like that that's helping things really open up and creating more connectivity between people. I also think they're hungry for it. Like, even though we all feel like so zoomed out, 
I guess if you think of, well, is it better to be totally by yourself and just watch Netflix? Or is it good to be in an event where you can hear humans interacting with each other and maybe look at one if you want to? So I think um, there's some interesting psychological things going on there too. That's just my perception based on some of the programs that we've been doing. Any comments, any other comments on that? Okay, great. Sarah, did I see that you had your hand up and then it went you down? You just covered what I was going to say is that I, I think that a lot of what's happening is that, you know, there's a real lowering of barrier of activation. And I think that encourages, especially under-resourced um, or people who would have more difficulty getting to meetings or participating in meetings for all kinds of different reasons. And, you know, so as much as all of us would really love to have like meetings in person, again, I think that the things we've learned in the pandemic are really kind of helpful in terms of thinking about how to kind of keep, keep this stuff moving forward and keep interactions amongst people who otherwise might not ever talk to each other. And I think that's pretty cool, so. You know, and that's specifically what NSF says to us. Like when we say things like, oh, we'll have a specific topic, they say, no, remember what we really love about what you do <laughs> is that you bring together these people that don't usually talk to each other. You know, and you're like, okay, we'll keep doing that, you know, but maybe we can find a way to kind of go broad and go deep, you know, in, in different ways. And so that's what we want to help people to continue to do. And uh, thank you, Megan, for making sure you reach out to Megan McCarthy in the Megan group chat. That's very cool to know that there is one. No, I'm kidding. So um, excellent. Well, this has been a great discussion as always. Uh, but we have, you know, we have a little more time if anybody has any other comments or questions, things you'd like to hear from us, um, other topics you'd like us to be, you know, bringing forward in future events, because we do meet every month. Um, we are planning to put together a broad conference for the entire KIC community. Um, we were we kept delaying talking about it to see if we wanted to do in-person hybrid or virtual, but I've decided we're gonna do virtual because there's just too much uncertainty uh, up and down with COVID. So um, that'll be a broader conference we're hoping. We're still thinking about how we wanna do that. It will be later this year. Um, and then we will be doing those annually as our thought process. So um, we always love your feedback. And we will be reaching out to some of you um, as we you know, as we were just talking to Alan, uh, as we know that there are some special areas you can help us think through with our, our kick extension project. Um, also, I wanna thank Dominique and Sarah. Um, I think Sarah, or, one, or both of them mentioned that we actually presented together to NIH as well. Uh, because we're NSF funded, but they're both NIH and NSF funded, and we want to bring this community together more. So as we uh, are planning our rollout of our updated database system with thousands of awards in it, you know, we thought there were only going to be 32. No, we thought there'd be less than 2,000, but uh, it's definitely uh, beyond that. Then we may be reaching out to some of you to kind of try out you know, try it, you'll like it or not like it, um, the new updates and the user interface and stuff like that as we're trying to bring more things together and kind of, you know, harmonize between what information is an NSF grant and what's an NIH grant and what do they call each other. And, you know, so we're doing all that normalization with our libraries team. Uh, so we may be reaching out to some of you for that too. Alan, did you have your hand raised? Just a, a thought building off what I think Megan and then Gerald picked up on with the Wondering what the, the network dynamic would be like in, in research generally, STEM side. Uh, no, we have not studied that here, but the, the COVID explosion of data, uh, we've been looking at analysis of emerging technologies for decades and had never seen anything like that. Like just the hyper exponential growth. And then the, the question of what does that do to uh, collaboration patterns and cross-disciplinarity and cross-nationality? Pretty interesting question. Might be worth it uh, a hard look or two. That's all. It's very interesting. You know, as we um, we're starting to think about the, the kick student challenge for this year, the student paper challenge, and that could be um, you know, it could be that we create a few topical ideas, not that they have to do that, but we could tease some of these ideas up. Um, there were a couple that came up in our monthly meeting with NSF too that 
you know, um, when they said, so how is the research changing over time? Like if you were to do an analysis of the awards that were funded in 2020 versus the ones that were funded in 2021, is there an evolution? Um, you know, one of the topics we've discussed is the social and behavioral side of it, you know, how humans are dealing with this. Um, you know, we kept, I remember my daughter asking me when this first started, since I'm the scientist in the family, you know, so mommy, how long do you think this is going to last? Was, well, you know, between a couple of months and maybe a year and a half. <laughs> and she was like, what? She got so mad at me. I'm like, I'm sorry. And then I was even wrong on the year and a half. <laughs> right. So, um, so the, the mental, you know, um, ingestion and digestion of this and how it affects us, you know, um, long-term and short-term along with the economic side of it that, you know, uh, Jerry was talking about. There's a lot to think about. And when we think about recovery, um, you know, what does that really mean, right? And how, where do we go from here? Um, and then how do we prepare, you know, for the next, um, the next pandemic, which could be COVID again, but so, um, you know, one of the new solicitations that NSF had, um, and a number of us submitted some proposals to it is PIP, which is Predictive Intelligence for, for Pandemic Prevention. And they're going to be announcing um, the awardees, I think they're hoping for in the March timeframe. So they're trying to get ahead of this stuff um, as much as you know, we're trying to get ahead of it as much as we can. And that will be an interesting collaboration pool for us too with the kick, right? As they're looking at predictive intelligence, is there intelligence that we have that they could be using, you know, through some of the COVID awards that we have. So we're going to continue down that path and feel free to share your ideas of, you know, topics that you might want students um, to do papers on. Okay, good. Um, well, that's everything I had in my brain. As I say, I'm empty, I think, uh, but I always learn so much in these. Thank you all so much for your open collaboration and the incredible research that you've done and that you'll continue to do. Um, are there any other comments or questions before we let you go a little early? That's always a gift when I get out of the meeting early, I think. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank Lauren once again for your great work in putting all of this together, our researchers for presenting and everyone who participated. And we hope to see you um, in our next meeting and everyone be safe and well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.